just that that level of flow this late in the year is always a good thing you know Absolutely. Both winner, i think cool Unfortunately, we didn't do any nymphing on that trip, but hey, you know, it's all good. <laughs> it's all right. I'm sure you've had plenty of practice. Yeah, you know. Times. <laughs> cool. So I guess, Tim, do you want to start, share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah, cool. absolutely. So uh, good evening. I'm Tim Doughton. I'm the senior merchant for the Orvis company in our fish and hunt division. Uh, I've worked for the company for 13 years, just around 13 years, and have been a, a, a lifelong fisher and uh, have been fly fishing since I was in high school. So just nothing I'd rather do than spend a day on the water. Cool. Awesome. How about you, yeah. Ethan? Yeah. Uh, I'm, my name's Ethan Law. I'm, I'm the fishing manager at Orvis Rochester. Um, I've been fly fishing for 15 years now. Um and uh, yeah, nymphing is one of my favorite techniques to use. Um, and having like a competitive fly fishing background, we do that a lot. So um, I'd like to say I know a little bit about it at least, but you guys can ask me questions and test my knowledge. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get cool. a few good ones this evening. Yeah, absolutely. Is anyone with us already here? You can comment in the chat if you're uh, watching. It's going to be really weird if it's silent. <laughs> That's all right. We'll just, we'll keep going. So, so hey, Ethan, why don't you kick us off and just maybe yeah. talk about why nymph fishing is such an important strategy as opposed to streamer fishing or dry fly fishing or just for that matter, any other kind of fishing. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, nymphs are uh, flies that live underwater. I think we, you know, should start there. Um, so trout eat, you know, little bugs that crawl around on the rocks underneath the water. Um, so that's a fly in its larval stage or nymph stage. And, uh, why we nymph is because 80 to 90% of their diet is subsurface. So underneath the water, um, fish are lazy. They don't want to work hard to, uh, eat. They also don't want to expose themselves to predators. So nymphing kind of offers that they can stay underwater, they can hide, they can just kind of pick away at things that roll by them. Um, so with fly fishing, nymphing can be super effective. Now, just to clarify this a little further, Ethan, is this predominantly a technique for catching trout or can you, in your experience, do you think you can target other fish species with this? Yeah. I mean, you can definitely, uh, target lake species with it. Um, you can like bass or bluegill or stuff, um, and you use a bobber for that. Uh, you can target, uh, small mouth and rivers and stuff like that too. So yeah, it's definitely multi-species. Awesome. And I know that in this time of year, especially where you're based out of in the upper Great Lakes, there are a number mm -hmm. of people who use this to catch those lake run species that move out of the big, out of the open water into the rivers and creeks, brown trout, uh, landlocked rainbows, also known as steelhead to some. <laughs> um, and that, and these things that we'll talk about are very applicable in that scenario as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably the, the thing I see the most and the most productive for lake run fishing too. So yeah, cool. Awesome. So let's start, let's talk about, let's, so we talked about why we would never yeah. fish, right? Cause fish spend most of their time eating insects that are, that live, spend their life, most of their life cycle below the surface of the water are more readily available to fish regardless of their species. Uh, and so we would, if we want to be successful as anglers, we would want to use flies that, you know, that, that match those natural, you know, food sources for the fish. So what is the easiest way to get started in fishing? Yeah. Um, so I think the easiest way is first go to your local shop and ask them. Um, they're going to have specific techniques for your area that work, maybe work better. Um, not to say, you know, any technique won't work anywhere at any given time, but, um, Definitely ask questions about it at your local shop. Um, you definitely want to start uh, picking up rocks. You know, dry flies, we can obviously see them on the water and identify them or see them in a tree or landing on your hat. Uh, nymph fishing, go in the stream, turn over a rock and uh, see what your local bugs are or see what's underneath there. Um, uh, also, you know, when you go into your local shop, uh, they're going to have suggestions like ready to go based on your area. So that can be super helpful. 
at least get you in the ballpark, right? Yeah. So you don't feel like you're just completely blind as to what flies to use. Absolutely. So the Let big mystery. Oh, yeah, yeah go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to ask you, like, so we go to our river, we see what flies are there. What is like the basic setup to nib fish that we use? Um, you know, what would you set someone with who's just getting started and wants to nib fish? Well, that's, a, that's a great question. I think there are a couple a couple of options that we could pursue for somebody who was, you know, just getting started. So for me, I think for somebody who's never done it before, the easiest thing to start with, and it's really applicable in the late summer and early fall, is fishing with a, dr a big dry fly and a dropper. Because in that scenario, that dry fly is your indicator, right? Mm -hmm. And it's much, it's much more intuitive because many of us have fished with dry flies. So you, you know what that, how that works and how that's supposed to go. So using one and then adding a nymph below it would be a kind of a baby step, if you will, to what nymph fishing is like. And it, I think it really instills this idea that you're going to fish the indicator when you get to that point because when you're use a dry and a dropper you're basically fishing the dry fly mending mm -hmm. it making the presentation where you, where you were if it was just a standalone fly but then you're trailing a nymph you know 18 15 to 20 inches underneath that and looking for that potential take on the nymph as, as much as on the dry fly. So it's a really easy way to, for somebody to say, hey, I've never done this. I don't know what fishing below the surface is like. If it's in the right season and, and, and it, it's applicable to your region of the world, um, it's a great way to get started just to get your feet or get your, you know, get your toes kind of in the water. And, you know, for many of us, that is often what we refer to as a hopper, uh, hopper dropper, where you're going to put a grasshopper on and then tied to the bend of that grasshopper, a piece of tippet material that's, you know, anywhere from 12 to 20 inches, give or take, could be a little longer. And you're going to put a small, usually a beadhead nymph underneath it and fish it just as you would fish a standalone dry fly. So for me, that's hmm. always been a kind of an intro to nymph fishing. Sure. I have another question based off that. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we nymph fish too, because it's probably... Not all the time, but it's generally the most effective way to actually catch fish. Um, to quote Hank Patterson, you know, if you go to a river and you actually want to catch fish, you got to bring a pile of nymphs. Um, <laughs> uh, and to add a question to that, um, and if you don't know who Hank Patterson is, you should definitely check him out on YouTube. He's hilarious. Um, how far, you know, you talked about tying the fly to the bend of the hook. How, how deep do you know how to be? How do you know when you're on the bottom? Because with nymphing, you know, you got to be on the bottom to catch fish. Um, so when you're attaching that fly to your dry fly, how do I know that it's on the bottom and moving correctly? Or how do I know fish are going to eat it? Well, it's a great question. And, and you know, that's the, that, that is the trick in nymph fishing is depth, right? It's all about where the fly is in relation to the bottom of the river and or where the fish are holding, which in many cases is at or near the bottom or very close to a piece of structure where they get relief from the current, but they also have a food, uh, a kind of a conveyor belt of food near them where, to your point earlier, where without a lot of effort, they can move slightly mm -hmm. and grab a piece of food. So, um, you know, in most nymph fishing scenarios, I think people have a tendency to not fish deep enough. Uh, and mm -hmm. often, you know, you know that because they never get caught on the bottom. Right. And so how do you know you're on the bottom? Well, pretty much if your indicator, whether it's a, a, a you know, a, a plastic, you know, ball or if it's a piece of yarn or it's a big dry fly or whatever it is goes down and you set the hook and nothing's there and nothing's there or you set the hook and it just it's stuck. Obviously, you you, you found the bottom. And I had a, a good friend years ago who, when I was learning how to fish, always said, you know, you should find the bottom first and then work up from the bottom which I always thought was interesting because prior to that, I always started fishing and would add weight or adjust depth until I found the bottom. And he's like, no, no, find the bottom and then work your way off mm -hmm. the bottom. It's much easier than trying to figure out where the bottom is. So um, obviously you want to have some contact with it, but you don't want to be in contact at all the time because you're going to get hung up and you're going to probably lose a lot of your stuff and mm -hmm. get really, really frustrated. Absolutely. I think that's a great quote. Find the bottom first. I've also heard that for streamer fishing, especially in the Great Lakes. 
you know, fish a heavy enough fly that you're getting snagged too much and then go lighter. So, so yeah, I like that a lot. Go, yeah, it's something that's always stuck with me. Um, let's go back to that kind of setup. So we talked about a dry yeah. dropper. I think that's a really easy, simple thing. I mean, I think for most people, it's it's obvious. Large enough dry fly to float the nymph or is um, mirroring some available food source that's in the area, whether it's grasshoppers, whether it's ants, beetles, crickets, uh, any other food source that may fall in the water and then trailing a nymph underneath it. Uh, by tying a piece of tippet, then to the dry fly, and then tying your nymph on. Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about nymphing, uh, most times we're talking about the using of an indicator, which fly anglers like to reference. Call it an indicator. It's a bobber, but it's not just any old bobber. It's a, it's a strike indicator. So they come in all different flavors, shapes, sizes. Um, I showed... I showed Ethan this earlier. This is my Christmas decoration for my <laughs> office. So these are all different kinds of strike indicators just set up on here. And they do they they all work in some degree or another. And they all have different advantages and disadvantages. But when we talk about nymph fishing with the indicator, we're really talking about that type of device in general. So uh, something you're going to attach to your leader that will convey to you, the angler, what is going on below the surface. How the fly is drifting, if you get a bite, if you're hung up on the bottom, uh, that is really going to provide you a very visual clue as to what's going on. And to your point a moment ago, if that indicator just goes down every two seconds uh, mm -hmm. of a drift, you're too deep, right? You're going to get stuck on, on, the, on the bottom. You're getting stuck on the bottom and, and ultimately you're going to have a frustrating day in that scenario. Yeah, so Ethan, I think so. Ethan, yeah, go ahead. I showed all these indicators. Like, what do you like to use? Like, what type of indicator works best for you? What do you What do you use when you do use one? I know you do a lot of Euro nymphing, which doesn't require one, but when you when you have an occasion to use one, what do you like to use? Yeah, um, I think for smaller water and small streams. So we're talking five to ten feet in width, and maybe you know maximum depth three feet. Um, I really like, actually I have them here, these uh, stick-on indicators. Um, you could do a dry dropper. Um, sometimes I think these are a little more sensitive and almost, um, I, it makes me focus on the nymph and the way it's drifting a little more. Um, I had an experience down in central Pennsylvania, Spring Creek, which is really famous, really picky wild fish. And um, they were all in a foot or less of water. Um, you know, we tried bigger indicators like an airlock or um, thingamabobber or something like that. But the best way we found to get them in under a foot was like these because they're just very direct and they're very sensitive um, outside of using a dry dropper. So that's kind of what I like for shallow water. For deeper water, I definitely prefer an airlock or something or um, thingamabobber or something like that. Um, something with a little bigger, a little bit more of a balloon shaped. Um, they tend to hold heavier flies better in order to get deeper. Um, this little one isn't going to hold a real heavy fly with a lot of split shot. Those big um, thing and bobbers will hold them much better and keep them in a better line. So there's an yeah, indicator for every scenario. <laughs> that's a really good point about, you know, how big of an indicator should you use? Like, how do you know, if, do I buy a half inch? Do I buy a three quarter? Do I buy a quarter? Do I buy an inch? I mean, yep. how do I know? Yeah, it's kind of an experiment. Um, you know, again, I'd, I'd use your local resources, ask your local shops um, what works best there. Like I know the Green River and Pro, uh, Provo, they actually don't use a traditional indicator. They'll use like a balloon, right? And blow it up and tie things off that. So it's all, you know, um, it's all area based, uh, but it's definitely good to have a wide array because you can change your indicator sometimes and not have to change your fly. And then all of a sudden your rig is the right rig for the area. And, and another one that, that you didn't mention, and I'm curious if you have much experience with it, mm -hmm. and I think it's pretty flexible as a yarn indicator, uh, both oh, yes. from shallow water, because you can, you can add or subtract the amount of yarn that you want to, you know, putting a fairly substantial amount and holding up a larger fly and maybe bigger and heavier water. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, those New Zealand uh, yarn indicators are super versatile. So yeah, good point, Tim. 
Yeah, and I think the other thing that 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 I've always kind of factored in when choosing an indicator is besides you know the size and what what type fly or what size fly am I going to use and will it hold it up is to, is also how easy is it to adjust because mm -hmm. the, the last thing you want to do is have to stop and spend several minutes of your day fiddling around with an indicator, move it six inches up or six inches down. So I think it's really important that regardless of the solution you choose, the ability for you to adjust the distance that indicator is from the flies is a really important and it needs to be relatively easy and straightforward, especially in the cooler months when your fingers stop functioning after a couple <laughs> hours and some cold water, you don't want to have to, to do a lot to get it to move. Absolutely. So Ethan, we have a couple of questions that's come yeah. in. So let's see if we can address some of these while we're going. So the first one says the best length of leader from the line to the indicator fly. Line to the indicator fly. So I think this is also can be situational. I think my favorite setup is actually using, let's say we're fishing for trout. Um, I really like a seven foot leader for nymphing. Um, it just seems a little more versatile because I'm always going to add some kind of fluorocarbon tippet to the end of my nymphing leader. Um, I'm usually using five X or six X and why I like fluorocarbon at the end is it's less visible, but really it's more abrasion resistant than nylon would be. Um, so I like to use like a, a shorter seven and a half foot, um, monoliter. And then from nymph to fly line, I guess it just depends on how big your river is. You know, if we are fishing a t small five foot stream, like spring Creek, um, I'm maybe it's maybe nine feet from your fly line, I guess, you know, I got two feet of fluoro, seven and a half feet of mono. Um, but yeah, it really depends on your, on your river. You know, if you're going to fish the Madison out West, it could be a totally different long leader setup to get super deep there. So. Absolutely. So this question, I think this next question is, is, is on everybody's mind. Who's kind of new to this is what is the best size rod to buy for nymph fishing? Right. I like, think you should so, answer that one, Tim. <laughs> well, you know, the answer, the answer really boils down to the type of fish that you're targeting and the size of flies in the body of water that you're fishing on. So any rod can nymph fish, but not every rod is going to be able to throw the type of flies and indicators that you want to use. So obviously, if you're going to target, like Ethan mentioned, if you're on a larger body of water, a big river, maybe you're throwing stonefly nymphs under a three quarter inch thing of a bobber. That's a lot of junk to throw uh with a fly rod and so uh your your everyday trout five weight is probably not going to get the job done or, or it will but it may not be as fun to get it done you know going to a six or maybe even a seven in that scenario is going to be I ideal uh the situation that ethan described on the spring creek he had fish in less than a foot of water my guess is he's throwing really small flies using a little foam pinch on indicator you could do that with a four weight uh, pretty easily. There's not a lot of, not a lot of, of, of additional weight that you're creating with that indicator there. I don't know, maybe you're using a, a even a three weight in that scenario, but mm -hmm. so, so the rod can, the rod, you can, you don't need a nymphing rod. Uh, I think you need a rod that's going to, to handle the size of flies, the type of fish and the body of water that, that you're, that you're on or that you're predominantly on and after. Absolutely. And this is going to be a theme, I think. Uh, go to your local fly shop. Because <laughs> someone who comes in and talks to me, um, and let's say they're going to fish some of our smaller local streams, I might tell them something completely different from someone who's going to fish a giant stream in Colorado. Um, and it's not because, um, it's just because difference of area, you know, and what you're doing, exactly like you said, Tim. So um, next question had to do with where do you attach the indicator? So where does it go? Like, and mm -hmm. how do I know where to, where to put it? And yeah. this, this is a, this is a really good question. And, and yeah. one that, uh, so I, this is, I'll say this before I let you get started, okay. wherever you start with will not be where you end with. So the idea <laughs> is that nymphing is dynamic in the sense that you're going to change constantly as you move up and down the water, maybe as flows go up and down. Um, I think it's important that you're you're really flexible in the setup. So, Ethan, I walk onto a body of water. I find a, a, a run or, or a ripple that I'm like, oh, I want to fish here. This looks really good. Where do I put the indicator? I think you should try to estimate the, the average depth of the water you're fishing. So 
A good rule of thumb is one and a half times the depth of the water between the fly and the indicator. So if your water is two feet deep, the fly should go to three feet uh, from the indicator to the fly. Um, that's a general rule. Again, that'll change. Um, as long as you see your indicator stopping occasionally or going the same speed as the foam line. Um, I think it's important to note that the subsurface of the water is moving much slower than the top surface. So if your indicator is going faster than the stuff at the surface, it's going way too fast and your fly is not on the bottom. If it's moving slightly slower or at the speed of the surface water, then you're probably generally pretty close. So one and a half times the depth is a general rule. Of course, that always changes, but that's what I would go with. So, so I'm fishing, I get there, I set it up like you said, feel like, hey, I can get started here. I'm fishing, I'm fishing, I'm fishing. I'm not catching any fish. I'm also not, not getting hung up, not, mm -hmm. what do you think I should, what is the next kind of approach after that that you think yeah, you should? Yeah, so if we're using one of those indicators that's easy to move up and down, uh, unwind it or whatever you need to do, move it up the leader. See if that changes, see if it slows it down, see if you start getting eats. Um, if not, you can always add more weight. That would be the second move. Um, keep in mind, you know, I, I, this is the opposite of where we're going to hit the bottom and go up. You can always add more weight. It tends to be a lot harder to take it off once you've got it on. So we're talking split shot, tungsten putty, uh, tungsten fly, um, kind of like that. That's probably where I would go. Okay. So that sounds great. So we think we've answered um, a bunch of the questions overall. So let's let's come back and just talk about setting up. So, you know, the mm -hmm. question is, how many flies? You know, is this a single fly? Is it multiple flies? And if it is multiple flies, how am I going to tie all these flies on? Is there a preferred method to doing that? Sure. Um I think most people should start with one fly connected to the or connected to your rig um, with a simple, you know, thing of a bobber indicator. I think when I set up new students, that's just the easiest way it translates from general like spin fishing or anything like that. If you've done that before, um, then you know if you want to add two flies, you can do a surgeon's knot from your leader to your tippet, and instead of cutting off both the tags, leave a tag and hang a fly off that. You could also tie a fly onto your leader, then um, attach your second fly onto the back hook of the first fly. Um, I generally don't like that setup because I want them to both swim and sing, uh, swim freely. So, you know, I like them also, sometimes if a fish eats that top one and the flies tied off the back, that can just become a mess and your fly can get caught on the fish, pull both out. So I just like to do a surgeon's knot, leave a tag, tie the first fly on. And then tie the second fly on after that. So let's make sure I, we've, we've got that. I think a lot of people, when they get started, they tie that first fly on and then they tie right to the bend of that fly and they go down mm -hmm. 10, 12, 15, 18 inches and they tie a second fly on. In your experience, you're saying while it works, it catches fish, it can create some issues, especially with the fish getting wrapped up in the mm -hmm. fly and also feeling like you're not allowing that fly to just float naturally through the, uh, through the water because it's tied to another fly effectively. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. Yeah, the distance no, between the two sure. are important. <laughs> no, no, this is a really, I think this is a really important topic because I think there are, there are as many ways probably to rig and uh, flies as there are people who nymph fish. Uh, but I think one of the ones that I see the most is just going bend to, to the next, you know, to the next fly is a pretty hmm. common, easy, easy kind of, I've never done this before. What makes the most sense? So it works, but it can create some challenges. You mentioned another way of doing it, right? So you're suggesting, uh, and this comes probably from your European nymphing experience of using that tag end of your tippet knot to, to tie, to add that dropper fly to, is that, is that how I'm understanding you do it? Yeah, absolutely. And then what about tippet rings? We do hear that every you know, tippet ring, just a really small metal ring. They come in a couple different sizes. Uh, for those of us who are a little older, you're going to need these and you're probably going to want a pair of these to hold on yes. to them, or you're going to be out of them in like 30 seconds. Um, after so, opening them. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you open them, you're going to go to the store and buy another pack of tippet rings. 
So do you, do you think those play a role here in, in how you can rig and does it make it easier? Yeah. Um, and I was also going to mention those new micro swivels we carry. Mm. Um, those are great also, depending on how you're ringing. So uh, a tippet ring can be super helpful. It's this tiny, tiny, tiny little ring that you can add onto your leader. Um, and it does a couple of things. One, you know, instead of cutting your leader back every time you tie on a new fly and, you know, wasting that expensive leader, if you add a tippet ring on right away and then add, you know, however many feet you are of tippet onto that tippet ring. So you have tippet, uh, ring and then your leader off this way. Um, that's just going to save you a lot of money in leaders. Um, it can also be cool in that you can add a second fly, another tag off that tipper ring. So you got the tipper ring, a fly off a small tag on that, and then a fly, you know, 18, 12 inches down. Um, if you're using some kind of short leader setup, like we do up here in the Great Lakes, where you're only using three feet a leader, and then your indicators right on the end of that. Um, that just can help turn it over. And we usually use a tip ring under that as well and just attach straight like 10 pound, like three or four or five feet. Um, so they're super useful. And I actually use them in dry fly fishing a lot too, just to extend my leader length. So it's just saving you leaders in the long run. Yeah, so if you've not had a chance to try them, they are great. They make rigging very easy. But like I mentioned, they're on this clip that I'm holding up. You can just see the dark shape. They are teeny awesome. tiny. So if you're a little older, your fingers are cold, uh, you may want to rig some of this stuff at home. And you definitely want to be able to grab that tippet ring with something when you tie it on. You can also tie them on while they're still on the clip that they come on so you don't lose them. That is a um, good good method. <laughs> that's the best method, right? Yes. So um, so let's see. so we decide we're gonna try two flies. Yep. Right. How far apart should those flies be? Yeah, I again it's you know, unfortunately it's all trial and error in fly fishing. There's no exact right way to do things all the time. Uh, one of my good buddies who catches as many fish as anyone I know keeps them six inches apart where I like to have them more like 10 to 20 inches apart. Um, why? Uh, it's just because the way I learned in competitive fishing. So I'm just used to them being that far apart where he does a lot of bottom bouncing uh, with a fly rod. Um, so he likes them real close and to have all that weight in one spot. So, you know, it's all personal preference really and situational. Right. And I think generally... One Go a ahead. foot at least generally yeah. if like someone's starting i'd say a foot is a good distance yeah i think it's important to note that um nylon especially uh leader material tip of material has a lot of stretch in it and when you make mm. it really really short you eliminate all that stretch and that stretch is actually protects the fly and the system a little bit when you catch a decently sized fish so when you make them really short, you lose that. And so you can, it can actually break off easier with a short piece of material as opposed to one that's a little longer because it has a little bit more give in the, in the system. At least that's what, again, that's what I was taught. And I'm kind of that 12 to 15 inch person, like sure, always 12 sure. to 15 inches apart, uh, never closer. Um, and, and I, I love this next question because it was right where I was going to go. So we talked about how far apart to keep the flies. Sorry, I got to get mm -hmm. my camera where my camera is. So about 12 to 15 inches. Where does the split shot go? Right. So if you need more weight, so the, oftentimes we fish flies that have uh, either have lead on, or lead free wire underneath them or have a bead tungsten or brass on the front of them that will cause the fly to sink. Sometimes it's not enough. Either the water's really deep or it's really fast. Uh, or the flies really small and you need to get it down, you know, quicker. Where, where do you put that weight in, in, in a system where maybe you have, you know, you have a couple flies that are 12 inches apart. Where's that split shot going to go? Yeah. I mean, I'd say the easiest and simplest method, uh, is going to be above those two flies. If I'm using split shot too, I would not recommend highly weighted flies. Um, that's just going to be hard, harder to cast. Um, It'll help you get down quicker, but it, it can really be tough to cast that much weight. Um, so yeah, I'd say general rule of thumb above your, you know, first fly, which is called your dropper. Your second fly is always called your point fly when you're nymphing. So above your dropper fly, I'd maybe start at like six inches to a foot. If you're in an area with really spooky fish, maybe move it maybe up a little even farther from that, from that dropper fly, maybe a foot or more. 
Um, if they're not too concerned, probably six inches is a good place to start. Yeah, and I think the faster the water, the the closer to the flies, the the weight uh, mm -hmm. should be. Um, it keeps the flies in contact or closer to the target, especially when water is moving really, really quickly. So I like that six to 12, feels right. And either we keep talking about split shot, all right? Which yeah. Which is just a, a, a usually non-toxic metal like tin uh, that has a slit in it. I So it's split that you would lay the leader in and then you pinch it closed, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we're adding the weight. Now, caution here is that you can damage the leader, especially if you pinch it for all you're worth. Um, it can get stuck in a rock. They can, they can <laughs> get too. stuck in a rock, yeah. Um, I, people have problem with their split shot sliding up and down on the leader uh, or coming off. Any, any advice on, you know, so we've talked about where it's just, you know, how best to attach that split shot, where do it, you know, do we, do you want to put it around a knot or just in the middle of the leader? Yeah. I mean, I think that'd be a great place to put a tip of ring right before your nymph rig. Um, so that tip of ring, if you tie it into your leader and put the split shot kind of on the end of that leader, I think that tip of ring will really help it from moving or a micro swivel. Um, that way you have a knot to kind of keep it in place and it can't move down any farther. Yeah. So I don't know how, how well this will show up, but there's a tippet ring. I have a yep. dropper fly off of it, which is right there. And then I have a point fly down here in my hand. So nice. You're suggesting that we put the split shot just above the tippet ring and that will hold it in place so it won't slide up and down. Yep. And then another axiom that a, a good friend of mine used to say is, well, it's kind of a kind of a bit of a joke. He'd say, what's the difference between a good nymph fisherman and a great nymph fisherman? And, he'd, and the, the, the punchline is one, one more split shot. shot. Yeah. One more split shot. It's so true. Right? So what is, what is, you know, what is your thoughts around that? Does it have to do with finding the bottom, um, you know, weight, seeing how much weight is this enough? Is it too much? Uh, how often do you think your fly should make contact with the bottom in it when you're nymphing? Yeah. I mean, they should be on the bottom, uh, every time. I think if you're getting caught up every cast, you probably have too much weight. If you maybe get caught up one out of every 10, uh, 15 casts and you're probably okay. Um, so yeah, kind of like that anecdote Tim used earlier, you know, maybe add too much at first. And then if they're easy to take off, take them off one at a time and see how your indicator's moving in relation to that foam on the, on the surface of the water and kind of experiment from there. Yeah. And another solution is to use a moldable, um, putty. This is tungsten putty. And so yeah, I was going to ask you with, about that. Yeah. So you can start with yeah. one split shot, kind of a small to medium sized split shot. And then if you need more depth, you can just basically tear a little piece of this off. It's like Play-Doh. It's like kids Play-Doh. And you would just roll it around the split shot. And then once you get it formed, and it's kind of arts and craftsy, you get it formed around the split shot. You just put it in the water for a couple of seconds and allow the colder water to kind of get it to solidify. Uh, it doesn't turn rock hard, but it gets, it gets firmer. And then once it does that, you're ready to go. And what's really nice about that is it's quick. It doesn't damage the leader. You can tear it off, put it on, take some, you know, it's just easy to adjust. And I think that's goes back to what I was saying earlier is you've got to be flexible. You're going to need, mm -hmm. if you move down in a run three, you know, five or six feet, all of a sudden the bottom goes from being three feet, you know, the water goes from being three feet to being six feet everything changes. You need to, you need to put your indicator farther up. You may need to add more split shot. So to fish the same setup just all day long and in different water conditions, different speeds, different depths is probably not going to be really productive. So you have to have a system that will allow you to adapt to all these different conditions quickly, easily, so that you can ultimately be more successful. So this tungsten putty comes in handy. I used to have a friend who would stick it on the side of his reel. So we always had, he didn't have to dig oh. it out. He just, it was just a piece of, he'd stick it on the reel and then he'd swing his rig in, tear a little off, put it on. Uh, obviously, a, you know, took it very seriously, mm -hmm. uh, but he was, he was incredibly effective angler. So that's another, another good way to approach it other than the split shot that we, that we talked about earlier. So. Um, awesome. So Tim, I actually want to switch back to gears here what type of water do we nymph in what water are we looking for that we want to throw a nymph in 
Well, I, again, <laughs> it varies widely, but I'd say yep. if it's wet, you should be nymph fishing in it, right? So um, the fish are going to be everywhere. Um, they, they uh, you know, they live in all different sections. They still water to, to moving water, to, to ripples, to runs, to pools, and you can nymph fish everywhere. The easiest place I think to nymph fish or that, you know, kind of somebody who's getting new or getting started is going to be in a little bit quicker water that is probably in that three foot to five foot depth range. It's a little easier to set everything up. You don't have a lot of distance between the indicator and the flies. You're not requiring a lot of weight and fish that are in that type of water are there to feed, right? Because it's usually quicker with less uh, holding place uh, opportunities for those fish. So they're there because they're on, they're on the hunt for a meal. So I think that's a great, a great place to start. And, um, you know, when you get fish in really slow water, they have a lot of time to look at the fly. So it's more critical in terms of the setup uh, that you have, you know, that you need to put together. But in that little bit quicker water, I think it's a, it's a great place to, to target. And, and, you know, we talk about this as if this is a moving water only scenario. There are many opportunities to to indicator fishing in, in still water and lake fishing you know uh especially if you get some wave action a little bit of wind a little bit of chop an indicator and flies and in lake scenarios can be another really effective way to target fish so it's not limited just to moving water hmm. uh just a quick question uh, about the putty that i showed a minute ago is it non-toxic yes it's a, a tungsten matrix so it's not a lead putty at all it uses tungsten for the weight so it's inert um and the binder is also environmentally friendly so it's not in fact would recommend no lead at all understand that lead's advantages is extremely heavy for its size and can get flies down but ultimately you're going to lose it at some point in time and leaving that lead in the environment is is not is not idyllic mm -hmm. uh at all um so that putty that we that we showed earlier is a, is a non-toxic um so ethan what about you what do you what kind of water do you like to to fish with an indicator yeah i think exactly what uh all those things you just mentioned um if you're new, I'd look for big, long pools and runs, uh, you know, where the water's kind of condensed into one area and it's really heavy and then slower on the sides. So like a really long riffle in that same depth that you're talking about. Um, that'll, uh, that'll give you the best chance for a feeding fish to be there. So now that we've, so we've decided we're, we're in fishing, we've decided we're, you know, we've talked about flies, we've talked about weight, we've talked about knots and how to mm. set it all up. So how do you actually fish it? Like, I mean, yep. No, good question. That? Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, so uh, the one thing that always kind of makes me crazy when I see people on a trout stream is when they're fishing downstream. I know you can stream or fish downstream and swing wets, but trout can see upwards pretty well. They can't see behind them. Um, so I'm always going to approach a run or a riffle or a pool from the back going up. Um, usually when you're nymph fishing too, sometimes at least where we are in New York state, there's a lot of tree cover behind you or above you. So you're probably going to have to be a pretty good roll caster. Um, that's also important. Uh, but yeah, approach the fish from behind, be a good roll caster, uh, throw an infinite indicator on, you should be successful. Yeah. So the other thing I would offer up and even dead on love it, uh, is that you want to treat the indicator like you would treat any, uh, a dry fly. That's just why I kind of started with that dry dropper example is that you want to do everything you can so that that indicator drifts as naturally as possible in the currents that you're fishing. Right. So, uh, from a casting side of things, you know, whether you use a reach cast or a stack, cast it to create some slack into the system so the indicator doesn't drag it's very just like fishing a dry fly drag is bad right so, uh so we want to make sure we're, we're we're either setting it up on the cast or once you do make the cast that you're mending or managing the line on the water in a way that allows that indicator to move perfectly uh in sync with the current which is what we refer to as a dead drift, right? That's the most effective technique to use when indicator fishing is a dead drift. So the indicator is drifting dead with the current, not going faster than or slower than the current. Um, so Ethan, if we did that, 
how do we know where our flies are in relation to the indicator? Uh, they- well, yeah, I tech, they should be, if we have the weight right, they should be just below or behind them. Um, Really, your indicator is your eye to what the flies are doing underwater. So if your indicator is slowing down or stopping or whatever, your fish, your hook got caught on something. Um, what I will say about indicators and fishing with them, if it looks at you weird, if it jiggles, if it wobbles, if it slows down, set the hook. Um, I think that's super important when nymph fishing. A common mistake I see by a lot of people is not setting the hook enough. Um, to quote the great Jesse, uh, the product developer at Orvis, hook sets are free. Um, he was a guide for a long time. So set the hook if the indicator even looks at you weird. <laughs> yeah, my, my favorite is when somebody turns to you and go, that was the bottom. And I'm always, my, my natural reaction is, how do you know? Yeah. Well, you, you don't. Unless you can see the fly actually make contact with the bottom, you don't. And yeah, hook sets are free. Take advantage of that. And, and um and, you know, it doesn't hurt just to just to give it a quick pull and see if there's something there and then just reset and keep going if, if nothing's there. So and we talked about this dead drift and you said, ideally, you want the flies directly below or slightly upstream of the indicator. Is there any visual clue that you may be able to pick up on if you're kind of new to this as to is that going on? you know, or do I have the flies going faster than my indicator or is there anything that people can kind of clue in on? Kind of like you mentioned before, we, we focus on a dead drift just like we would a fly, a dry fly. Um, but again, if that indicator is moving faster than that top current, especially in an area with a lot of foam and white on top of the water, um, you want your indicator to be moving slower than that. That'll mean your flies are below it or behind it, just like we want. You know, and if it's bouncing a little bit because of the weight of the flies, that's okay. Um, that usually means it's behind. Okay, so here's a, here's another question. So, what color? They come in. It's like a pack <laughs> oh of Skittles, gosh. right? Yeah. And you open up a thing of indicators. It's like you just got a pack of Skittles from the store. What color and why? Why would I choose one color over the other? I'd say whichever one you see the best. <laughs> um, I know some people uh, get a little crazy with the colors and they'll only use clear or white because it looks like the foam. I've never had a real experience where I've spooked fish because of the color. Um, I've had fish eat my indicator. Uh, I've had steelhead eat my indicator, which is always surprising. Um, and uh, yeah, whatever you can see the best. Yeah, I think that's the, that's, the, that's the most important thing. You need to be able to see it. If you can't see it, it's not doing you any good. So why, why, would, you even, why would you even have one to begin with if you, can't, if you can't easily pick it up on the water? So absolutely, um, there's no wrong there, just so we're clear. Color is a personal preference thing. So, you know, have fun. And like I said, there's, there's a bunch of different indicator options there. And not all of them will serve a purpose or will work really well for some people in some places. So you'll have to experiment a little bit and decide, um, you know, what style, what color, what, you know, what size, all what works for you and how to, how to set it up. So have you ever fished it where you allow the indicator to, to not dead drift and had success? Or is that something that is just the result of bad management? Um, certainly have a lot more success when the flies, cause it makes them look more natural. You know, that subsurface is so slow. They've seen a million nymphs go by and they know if it looks weird, but certainly there is, um, always a time where the rule is not always correct. Um, so, you know, dry dropper fishing, if you fish a super lightly weighted nymph below a dry fly and it's going a little faster than the current, but maybe just in the foam below it. Um, certainly a fish would eat that. That's usually going faster than, you know, the substrate or the subcurrent. So we're getting into fall. We're in fall in New England and in New York where it's very much the fall. Um, Mm -hmm. waters are cooling off. Fish are getting a little more active again, coming off the heat of the summer. Um, is there a time of day that is better suited to this than, uh, than another uh, given this time of year? Or does it feel like an all-day thing? I actually, uh, you make a great point uh, and lead me into something. Um, Usually, I would say mornings or nights in the summer are the best time to nymph when the water's the coldest um, and there's low light. Um, 
But this time of year, as the water really cools down, their fish's metabolism will slow down and they'll start to feed less. So maybe midday is, this is the one time where midday might be better or later in the day as the water's heating back up again and their metabolisms are increasing. So they need to feed. Um, so yeah, great question, Tim. Yeah. So, so early fall, like October, maybe September, it can be kind of a all day or maybe morning, mm -hmm. evening, morning, afternoon, winter, when it gets really cold, the water temperatures are dropping, you know, they're in the forties, maybe high thirties. You want to fish in the warmest part of the day just to play it back. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's also really advantageous for the angler right if it's the sure. water 38 degrees and the air is 38 degrees you probably want to find the warmest part of the day to be out there and not be out there at 6 a.m yes uh, freezing um i got cool. a question for you tim yeah how do you know what flies to pick when you get to the water or how do you personally pick whatever nymph you're going to use that day you know what? I was going to ask you the same question about flies. So, I'll answer it after. <laughs> okay. So you said it earlier, but just a good time to reiterate, you should always start with somebody. If you've never been there before, go to your local shop, talk with another angler who mm -hmm. frequents that body of water and say, Hey, not been here before, or I'm going to start nymphing. I've never done that. What should I use? And just like dry flies in, in nymphs, there are a collection of flies that are more generalistic. Right. So in, in dry fly world, we talk about the atoms or, you know, the atoms is a, is a great dry fly because it imitates mm -hmm. a lot of different things, but nothing necessarily specifically. In nymph fishing, there are similar type flies. Right. And so if you have no idea, somebody dropped you on a piece of water and said, here you go. What flies would I want to have with me? I think there are a couple that, that always ring true uh, for me. And that's. Uh, and they're predominantly mayfly, generally mayfly imitations, which are hmm. probably the most kind of widely distributed other than midges, aquatic insects. So uh, thinking things like a gold ribbed hare's ear, uh, hmm. preferably with a bead. I, I'm a bead person. I like a little bit of extra weight on my flies. So I always defer, I always go with a bead. Now the disadvantages hmm. to that are exactly what Ethan described earlier. If I have one foot of water, a bead's going to, create a problem for me because the fly is going to go right into the rocks um pheasant tail right mm -hmm. it's a nice compare uh, it's a nice contrast to the hair's ear hair's ear is lighter colored tannish and that pheasant tail is going to be darker brown so it gives you kind of a color variation a little different uh similar profile but just a little different color in several sizes uh a prince nymph although not a mayfly imitation um mm -hmm. kind of more on the stonefly side feels like another one that you know, don't leave home without it uh, as a fly that if I just, if I don't know. Um, and I always, if I, if I'm not sure, you know, kind of looking at that 14, you know, 12 to 16 on the size, it's just a general rule of thumb. And Ethan, you said it best also earlier was turn over some rocks, right? Yeah. If you go to a body of water, get in the, get in the water, get, in, you know, find a little ripple, a little run. That's a, that's, you know, less than a foot deep, grab some rocks, start turning them over you don't have to know what it is. You don't have to know the Latin name for it. You don't have to know anything about it mm -hmm. other than the fly that I have in my box looks very close to this bug that I'm seeing on this rock. I'll start here and see how it goes. So um, there are a number of other flies that you could, you know, that people, a lot of people will be like, hey, I always have a, a, a squirmy worm or a San Juan worm in my box. Is kind and of a, a mop fly. A <laughs> mop fly is another go-to kind of clean it up fly, if you will. Um, how about you? What are some of your favorites if you were to just have a couple in your box all the time? Yeah, I mean, a pheasant tail is definitely in there. Um, you know, I'm very simple. I really only carry six patterns and one's, you know, a zebra midge, um, yep. one's a pheasant tail, um, one's a waltz worm, and we carry mm -hmm. the tactical SOB, which is very similar. Um, then I also have some type of perdigone, which we carry um, Spanish bullet. Um, it's just a really thin, small mayfly pattern that sinks deep. I really like stuff with tungsten. I like stuff that gets to the bottom quickly. Um, and that one with a thin profile gets down very, very quickly. So in heavy water, it just makes it a lot easier for me to get on the bottom. Um, and yeah, I'd say those are a couple that I fish pretty often. And 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 it, I think it, your example of earlier is it's important to have some width beads and some without because yeah. you will find situations where fish are so shallow 
that anything, if the fly has any weight on it at all, mm-hmm. you're just going to spend your day getting your fly out of the rocks. Absolutely. So it's not always super deep. I need lots of weight. I got to get down really fast. You need to, to kind of be prepared for a number of options. So, and, and Ethan, in your experience, is just covering water the best tactic here? Or do you, do you, when you go, do you like to find fish, like see them um, before you start fishing? Um, I, I like to cover water. Um, you know, a great rule too, when you're nymph fishing is don't walk in the stream before you make a cast. Mm. Um, you'd be surprised at how many fishes are on, how many fish are on the edge of stream, the like, size. I mean, it's uh, unbelievable, even in six inches of water. Um, so start fishing as soon as you get to the bank. Um, cause you know, in heavily densely populated fish populations, uh, the fish are going to be everywhere. Um, you know, if it's a stream that doesn't have a ton of trout and maybe isn't as productive, then, you know, you could probably skip the bank and walk in. Um, but how do you know without trying? So I like to cover water. Um, I was also going to bring up, uh, I really change pretty frequently if I'm not catching fish. So the biggest thing I see in fly fishing one-on-one students is kind of the hesitancy to rig and change. Rigging is not the most fun, but the more you do it, the faster it gets, um, And, you know, all it can take is that one split shot for you to be able to catch a fish. So that might be the difference between a zero fish day and a 10 fish day. Um, So definitely change and rig constantly um, and kind of cover water is how I approach it. Now, when you say change, Ethan, are you talking about the flies or the the setup in terms of weight in the indicator or, or both? Sure. I'll probably change the weight and indicator first. Um, again, I think it's more important to get a good drift than it is to have the exact right fly. Um, you know, fish only have about a foot and one or two seconds to look at these flies as they're going by. Um, so if you get a good drift and it looks natural, they're probably going to eat it. Um, so I'd probably change that first and then fly second. Yeah, I think that's how I approach it. I think depth uh and weight are the are the most critical and if and then fly selection would be would be second so i i i I very much agree with that strategy i think it's the best way to approach it and then what about barbs you know should you pinch the barbs Mm. down on the flies uh if they're not already barbless uh what's your feeling about that uh barbs are there to keep bait on um in my opinion so uh, I fish all barbless manufactured hooks, like the Orvis, you know, tactical hooks. Um, and, I, you know, frankly, in my experience, if you know how to play a fish and you hook it, you're not going to lose it unless something weird happens. Um, so I think barbs really don't offer any any help as far as nymph fishing goes. Yeah, I would say my, you know, I, I'm, I'm a dad. I have five kids. I've taken them all fishing. Mm-hmm. The other big thing about barbs is barbless flies are easier to get out of me uh, yep. because I've had to remove a fair share of them from me personally. Uh, and barbless flies come right out. So uh, it is something else to keep in mind, not only from the fish's standpoint, but it de- they definitely mm-hmm. come out of people a lot easier uh, <laughs> it, as well. So, um, all right, let me look through the questions. Is, um, is it worth having a, I'm assuming dry fly on in late fall or winter? So is there winter dry fly fishing, I think is the question, uh, or is winter fishing really just a nymph game? No, I think there's definitely dry fly fishing. Uh, we have a spring Creek that's not super far from us. It stays 40 degrees all year and fish will rise there in January. Um, so yeah, you can definitely fish a dry in winter, depending on where you are. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, obviously the U S has a, and, and across the world, a diversity of climate. So in many, in many times, you know, the dead of winter in, in Texas is, is really, uh, is like being in New York in September. And so, uh, the fishing there can be phenomenal and have all the, all the, you know, from nymph fishing to streamer fishing to dry fly fishing, you know, in a January day. So again, being prepared, being, you know, uh, flexible is going to be key. Um, Ethan, I think we covered this, but it, this question came back up. Do you set up with the smallest fly at the bottom and the biggest fly at the top? So it's just, this is a recurring theme. It's one I yeah. think we should hit again. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would probably set the smaller fly on top and the bigger fly on your point fly, which is the fly farthest away from your fly line. Um, you know, if it's a weight thing, definitely have the weight at your point fly and your lighter fly at the dropper fly. 
Um, that just helps keep them in line under the water. Um, and yeah, sometimes if, if it's not a weighted scenario and it's just size, it's sometimes nice to not spook the fish maybe with a smaller fly versus the bigger fly at the back. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go hot and heavy with a mop up front and then a little midge behind it. It doesn't make sense in my mind. So, <laughs> but hey, you know, again, there's always, um, always a, probably a place where that works great. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, like you said earlier, this is really an experiment game, right? So be willing to change your rig, move the flies, change them around, move the indicator, add weight, take weight off. I think that it, it's that experimentation that you'll you'll come across a combination and where you're fishing on you know, the body water you're on that is really productive for you. But you have to be willing to change uh, all of those elements throughout the course of your day on the water until you find the the magic combination that seems to work. And even then, if you change water depth or type of water, you may have to start not completely over, but you'll need to fine tune. Uh, fine tune your rig to be to be more productive. Um, all right, Ethan, what else can we tell? What can we share about nymph fishing that will help somebody who who may not yeah. uh, may not be comfortable with it? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of casting tips besides the um, besides the roll cast that you should definitely get comfortable with. Um, there's the snake roll, which is an addition to the roll cast, which just helps you roll cast essentially a little farther. So you make a roll cast and then you do another shorter roll cast with more line on the water to get it to come out a little farther. Um, and then I think also the tuck cast can be super important. You know, we use a lot of neuro nymphing, but if you're in really fast, deep water and you need to get your flies done quickly, uh, there's a cast you should look up called the tuck cast. It's probably on our learning center somewhere. And what it does, it just adds slack into your flies as they hit the water. If you've ever dropped anything in any kind of water, if you throw it in there super hard, it kind of, it kind of takes a second before it falls. But if you were to just drop a fly in the water, it goes straight down if it's weighted. <laughs> so that tuck cast is kind of introducing slack into your line so your flies sink much quicker. And then, Ethan, the specialized casts are, are really important, you know, kind of as, as you grow and progress in the sport in the in this particular facet of it but when you're talking about throwing an indicator a piece of split shot and maybe two flies is there yeah. anything that you need to be aware of just in a, if you're just making a general overhead cast like what are some dangers that uh, may exist there sure um you know with all that stuff on there you really don't want to make any sudden moves you don't want to make any jolty quick kind of things um when throwing that kind of rig you really just want to do it in one kind of motion. And again, just not be herky jerky or that stuff can be a rat's nest pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you talked about no one likes to do all the rigging, you know, yeah. well, untangling and re-rigging is definitely something that nobody enjoys. And I find slowing down a little bit is also mm -hmm. really helpful and not trying to throw super tight loops. It's almost you, not lobbing, but to create much softer of a cast it keeps the, 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 the rig a little farther away from the rod. It keeps it a little farther away from the trailing line. Uh, you're not, it's not going to look pretty throwing indicators in multiple flies and split shot is not a graceful thing in many cases, mm -hmm. but I love your point. Don't be jerky, be a little smooth, slow down just a little bit. Um, and be really aware of the wind and what's behind you with all that, especially with all that stuff on your, on your line. Cause it can, uh, it can quickly go the wrong, uh, in a hurry. Uh, and I think one more thing I want to cover that we haven't yeah. hit yet is actually mending. Um, I get a ton of questions about mending and when do I mend and what is a mend? Um, a mend is just putting a little curve or slack in your line so that your indicator can drift naturally. So mending is just moving the line with your rod tip in a certain area. Um, do you mend upstream? Do you mend downstream? Totally depends on the water type and scenario. The best thing I can tell you though, is that you just want your indicator to tell you when and where to mend. So, you know, if you make a mend upstream, your first cast and your indicator all of a sudden gets pulled out of the drift or your fly line pulls your indicator, try it the other way the next time or go both different ways. Um, mending super important to keeping that indicator slowed down and in, in the right current you want it to be in. That's, that's a really good point. Cause it's not just heave it and leave it. You actually have right. to work 
work it while it's on the water. Um, last question, because we're coming up on the top of yep. the hour. Uh, do you add anything on the fly, like with dry flies and floating or anything on the line itself? So sink, sink agents, do you add anything to, to the system? I don't. Um, how I help my sink rate is using really thin tippet, <laughs> which I would not recommend to start. But uh, just another thing to add into the whole mix of what leader, bobber, uh, excuse me, indicator, uh, fly <laughs> I use. Um, you know, the size of your tippet is going to affect how, how quickly your flies sink. So if you need to get down faster, I use 6X all the time um for trout anyways and so. you said fluorocarbon over nylon for tippet and and again mm -hmm. the advantage is it's more abrasion resistant it naturally sinks as opposed yep. to nylon right those were kind of the big differences absolutely now you may have to treat the indicator especially if you use a yarn indicator or a dry dropper setup like we talked about earlier you will have to treat both of those with a floatant in order for the, uh, throughout the course of the day so that they will stay on top and and especially if you catch a few fish that pulls that mm -hmm. indicator fly or yarn indicator under the water you will have to periodically treat that so awesome well, Ethan, the hour's gone. Uh, Sweet. Hard, hard to believe it went that quick. So I know there's a. I know we covered a lot of ground. Some of this may not have been really clear in the, in our explanation, but I know there's yes. a lot of resources and uh, yeah. video on howtoflyfish.com, right? Which is Orvis's kind of learning center. Yep. Uh, where there are lots of resources there, and of course you've mentioned this, and you know there are fly shops all across this country, and they're full of people that want to help. Mm -hmm. uh, they can help you set up your rig, pick out flies, choose the right indicator, tell you where to go, what to use, when to be there, uh, and encourage you to find one locally that can help you in your journey. Um, I think that's a, another great place to start. Absolutely. I know I would rather talk fishing than fold t-shirts at the shop. So don't tell my boss that, but <laughs> please come in and talk my ear off about fishing. <laughs> I'm sure all the other fishing associates feel the same way. So Absolutely. So, well, thanks. Thanks, Ethan. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Tim. Good luck, right. everyone. Take care.